part. So hello everybody, good evening and welcome to Milton Keynes Lit Fest. Uh, this is our second uh, Zoom event. So if we're slightly fumbly, that's because we're old, old people that don't natively do this kind of clever techie stuff. So just bear with us, uh, we're doing our best. Uh, this evening we are announcing the winners of our 2020 creative writing competition City of Dreams and if I find my copy and hold it up and we're also launching this beautiful anthology which has literally just been published and you uh, can now buy online. I, as the evening goes along if you look in the chat window Guy, who's, who's running the technology for us this evening, will post you a link of where you can go to, to buy a copy. Um, as well as our winners and <coughs> other of the contributors, we have included 12 readers this evening because we couldn't possibly expect you to sit through 40, 40 writers and readers, no matter how wonderful they're writing. Uh, we're joined this evening by our special guest, Jack Sheffield. Jack, if you want to wave to everyone. Hi, everybody. Jack is, a, is an author now of, am I right, 14 novels? Yes. And, uh, a man of experience. Uh, he's going to say a few words before we, we start and a few lovely concluding remarks as well. Uh, Jack used to be a head teacher, so behave yourselves or he'll put us all in detention. Um, <laughs> This is actually the second time that Litfest has run a writing competition. We, we did this first in 2018 uh, when we published a magazine that we called Mink. Uh, we arrived at the name via various hideous convoluted puns, uh, but that was a completely open competition. It didn't have a theme. Uh, this year we decided that we wanted to revive that idea. Uh, and we came up with the theme of City of Dreams. Uh, people could submit flash fiction, piece of, of prose of up to 500 words, or poems of up to 40 lines. Um, and we were very struck by the divergence of ways in which people interpreted our theme. Uh, some people, because this is a, a local and regional writing competition, obviously assumed that by City of Dreams we meant Milton Keynes, which in a lot of ways we do, hey, we're proud of the place. Uh, some people saw it as an opportunity for speculative fiction uh, about dream cities in general. Some people were very dystopian. Mm -hmm. uh, what impressed us above all was the very high quality of the submissions that we received. Uh, there was a selection panel, myself, Guy, who's helping to run this evening, uh, Sharon Clark, who I think is also with us, and Joe Wellings. Uh, and we want to thank you for having made our lives so difficult because it really was quite hard picking the entries that we were going to include in the anthology. There are a lot of discussions and and an awful lot of Excel, wasn't there, Guy? Mm. That spreadsheet went round and round and round for a long time. Um, but we we did eventually pick 40 pieces that we wanted to publish in Mink, and we also picked our winners. So this mm -hmm. evening we are introducing you to a selection of those readers and to all of our winners. And I'm going to start uh, by introducing the poets in our 14 to 19 uh, age category. And our first reader this evening is Jude Lees with a poem called A Word From Our Sponsor. Jude is a sixth form student living in Milton Keynes who enjoys writing poems in many different styles and formats and, and thinks that virtual festivals like this are a great way for sharing them. So please step up to the microphone and, and read for us, Jude Lees. Okay. Right, this is dedicated to uh, John Lennon who should have been 80 this year. <laughs> so, so you've had enough, just about all you can take. Well, ladies and gents, we have an announcement to make. We grew a new city where once there were fields. An illusion? No, sir, I assure you it's real. Get out of the rush, find yourself someplace new, with its greens ever lush and its sky always blue. Come somewhere pedestrians and cars never meet, where you're surrounded by trees as you walk down the street. Our shopping facilities are all you will need. We'll give you a tour if you follow our lead. And when you're all tired, it'll be time to go home. And they're selling fast, so get on the phone. Say lens now, everything must go. Come live in our city. 
Now enjoy the show. Back to you. Lovely. Thank you, Jude. Uh, and <clears throat> in this category, we had two winners. So I'm going to hand over to Jack to introduce the first of them. Take it away, Jack. Thanks very much and good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be uh, uh, part of uh, this evening. Um, thanks to Guy, who sent uh, a copy of City of Dreams full of brilliant writing by uh, local authors. And uh, I've spent this afternoon uh, reading it. For those of you who don't know me, just before I introduce uh, Neve, uh, I'm Jack Sheffield. I, um, I'm a retired primary school teacher. And I wrote a first novel, this one, uh, Teacher Teacher, when I retired. I took it to the Winchester Writers' Conference and it was picked up by a London-based literary agent. And he um, sent it off to six mainstream publishers. They all wanted it. So I was very fortunate and it sold in significant numbers. And um, I was taken on by Penguin Random House. And as Dave, our inimitable host, has just mentioned, uh, this is number 13 that came out uh, last month and uh, appropriate title, Back to School. And I've finished number 14 that comes out uh, uh, next year. But more from me later, because I'm looking forward to um, uh, Niam. Can I just say thanks to Jude? I really did enjoy that. Great rhyming couplets, concept of growing up in a new city, and the line, pedestrians and traffic never meet. I thought it was brilliant. But our first joint winner in the 14 to 19 uh, poetry category is Neve, who adores literature, like me, and she has a poem, Virtual City. So over to Neve and Virtual City. Hello. Virtual City. Under the welkin, split ned lud and I, one peppered moth to a gallon moth rye, yonder lud and I sundered forever. From then it was night, yet windows unrolled, so I danced with kinkies, fun it is called, and I fell in the web of his wiry world. He embraces me in his city of words, a place replete with telephones and clouds. Whilst watching how all the traffic will skim, we share in a raspberry pie and win as a game of electric go-karting. Locked in the knack me, I don't think of quitting, that is, until he crashes. Brilliant. Thank you. Well done, Neve. Um, I found that to be a real quirky poem. You read it beautifully, by the way. Interesting words. I love new words. I wasn't familiar with Welkin, sky or heaven, and Gallimorphery, confused jumble or medley of things. So I've learned some new words tonight. So uh, well done, Neve, a joint winner along with Rufaro, uh, who's written Where I Long to Live. Uh, Rufaro's 15, clearly very talented and a deserved winner. So over to Rufaro and Where I Long to Live. In this city, the ambience of ardour imbues the air, folklore with buoyancy, unobscured by the vice of man. In this city, the principles of prejudice fail to demarcate people's individuality and material presses the influence of brutality. In this city, the bylaws of belief govern the intellect of all. Nature prospers as life moves on with composure. In this city, the morality of minors is not exploited. Children are illustrated with the notion of yearning for ease. In this city, the freedom to be oneself secures the knot that humanity had once frayed. Well done. Thank Before you. I pass back to Dave, can I just say, um, well done to Rafaro. You read it beautifully. A deserved winner. I love the excellent repetition of the phrase in this city. And Thank it you. resonates with the freedom to be oneself. So very well done. And back to Dave for the next category. Thank you, Jack. Uh, our next category are the adult poets. Uh, and the first writer that I'm going to introduce is Gordon Adams uh, with his piece, You Make It Whatever You Want To. Gordon is a marketing consultant and public speaking coach based in Olney and the author of Overcoming Redundancy. He belongs to the North Hans Writers Inc. writing group. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you. 
Thank you. You make it whatever you want to. You make it good or you make it bad. You make people happy or you make them sad. You make it daytime or you make it night. You make things feel wrong or you make them feel right. You feed the weeds or cause flowers to grow. You make it whatever you want to, you know. You trip people up or you help them to stand. You turn them away or you reach out your hand. You make life a desert or fill it with streams. You pull down your town or build cities of dreams. You write this whole play. You direct this whole show. You make it whatever you want to. You know. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I remember when we were going through uh, selecting the pieces to include in the anthology, and I imagined that as a song. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> I could I could see somebody with a with an acoustic guitar belting that out in a street corner. <laughs> can you play? <laughs> uh, I can, uh, but we need to stop and write the music. I'm not sure that we have the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Uh, Second poet that I'm going to introduce is Shirley Ann Cook uh, with her poem, Hope. Shirley, welcome. Hi. Hope. In this city, nights fall quickly and they are cold. In this city, it rains often. We slip on boots, splash through puddles and wash away our fears. In this city, we wake to the sound of birdsong, not gunfire. Here we can talk freely, neighbours are friends. In this city, now our city, we will grow old. Well done, Shirley. I think it's over to me now to, it uh, is. to introduce the winner, Sarah. Before that, can I just say well done to Gordon, who was already a, a, a published author. Uh, you make it whatever you want to. So a very direct poem, using rhyme well about the choices we make in life. I was real struck by the real clarity in the use of language. So well done, Gordon. Thank you for that. And thank you, Shirley, who read it beautifully. The poem, Hope. Uh, Shirley's already a published poet. Each verse is a real powerful statement that begins with, in this city, I really enjoyed the terrific conclusion. In this city, now our city, we will grow old. So well done. But it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Sarah Davis, a published poet. Like me, she's an exile from the north, but she's from Merseyside. Uh, Google, City of Dreams. So over to Sarah with Google, City of Dreams. Google, City of Dreams and it's LA, Mumbai. No room for you, my own little city. Millions dream of these others, Holly and Bollywood. Their smiling actors populate the night and there's jasmine in the air in both places. Jealousy and pollution. You don't exist yet, though I've walked through you at 3 a.m. for years. The nonsense of your geography, under domes and captive clouds, a failed pink. All that glass, I think, just to see my own reflection. Just before I pass back to you, Dave, can I say a big thank you to Sarah and congratulations. Of course. Uh, I love the uh, comparison made with other so-called cities of dreams, such as LA and Mumbai. And I really love the image, and I quote, I've walked through you at 3 a.m. for years, the nonsense of your geography. Brilliant. <laughs> came from Merseyside to read that for us, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Dave. Right. Thank you, Jack. Uh, now on to the flash fiction writers. Uh, and we'll start with the 14 to 19 year old flash fiction writers. And our first reader is Michelle Githua, uh, who will be reading Happy's Atlantis. Michelle is an aspiring author and TV writer and wrote Atlantis to explore her dilemma be between what she wants for herself and what the cosmos or God wants for her. Michelle, please take it away. Hi, 
Plato from the Atlantic. Our tip. The roaring sea will dull my moans as I hit the water. The waves will lap into one another as they heave themselves onto the rocky shore, then back again. The unconscious act of breathing will become a careful, uncertain one. I'll know then. I'll die. I'll beg silently for mercy, but God won't hear me. And the deep laughter of passing thunder won't care. The slow hum of my heartbeat will distance. The expansion of my lungs will weaken. The excited impulses in my brain will tire. Soon I will pass. I'll inhale deeply and fearfully before being thrust back down into the cold darkness. The moon, a kind ally, will smile down on me as she exposes the tangled weeds and callous stones piled on top of each other, bending around like dancers at the opera. With only seconds of air left, time will go against its own rules and still. It will be there, rushing around in the very thing I want to kill me, feeling the violent waves of the surface turn to gentle ripples that I'll become numb to the pain of my life. Thoughts will become a chore, and my purpose will become trying to understand my necessity. The light will be too dim to make out what the stab read, so I'll run my hand across it and feel the indent of the letters L and N when a thought, a tedious, childish thought will arrive and I won't be able to ignore it. The name haunting and exciting me at the same time, but it won't be enough to make me say it. The word will hang off my tongue, scratching at my lips and beg to be spoken. But how will I say I know this is Atlantic? There will be a sad happiness to the empty place, where the faint laughter of children run between the pillars, or the bustle of adults who now stream with their city for life. It will be beautiful. It will be impossible. I'll revel in finding the city alone, accidentally. Then I'll realize how I begged God to spare my life and then stop time to reveal the city to myself. I won't be dying. A dying man couldn't feel the stones scratching at his leg if he goes further into the room. If they could see this, they'd finally look at me with respect I was owed. For those who couldn't apologize, I'd forgive them because they deserved it. It was the pain they caused that led me here, standing at the foot of my city. A choir will sing as the violent ripples come in my side. Time will slowly lower his leg onto my chest and squeeze the last bit of air from my lungs. I'd remember, giving the world my last breath. The choir would sing for my soul. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, listening, listening to you and reading through all of the entries, something that, that struck us with all of the, the younger writers was if I'd been past those to, to read and I didn't have any other information, I wouldn't have been able to go that was written by somebody 14 to 19, that was written by somebody much older. The maturity of the, the young people's writing was, was really quite remarkable and, and beautiful to see. Uh, thank you for being an example of that. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me introduce our next uh, reader, which is Shannon Lockwood, running, reading a piece called Running. Uh, let me find Shannon's details. Uh, Shannon is 18 years old and enjoys reading, writing, and looking after animals. Shannon, welcome to MK Lit Fest. Thank you very much. Uh, this is running. I'm walking through the city. This isn't the place of my dreams. This is more a city of nightmares, the ones you cannot escape from. Running, tall buildings looming over you, smothering you, smothering creativity, because they're all the same, same colour, same style, oppressive and stifling. Cars parked on both sides of the street, Everywhere, in fact, blocking pavements, making streets unsafe for children to play on. And I think to myself, as I try to run from the sameness of it all, perhaps around the next corner, the next bend in the street, maybe there will be the city of dreams. Perhaps around the next corner, there will be a house, just a house on its own. Ivy growing up the walls and around the windows. A garden, tidy enough to show order, messy enough to show individuality and laughter. A garden of laughter, a bicycle with a stabiliser still on, a symbol of hope in the shape of a rainbow wind chime spinning in the breeze, with no tangible earthbound sound emitting from it. It still seems to burst with music, 
dancing with the bird song floating on the wind. Maybe if I turn and run this way, there will be a park, a huge expanse of green space, trees, grass, bird houses, and bug habitats. The kind of expanse you get when you climbed a craggy hill and you can see green, lush and fresh and natural all around you with the heather wave waving in the breeze and the trees swaying and rustling in time with the beck that is snaking its way through the verdant, viridescent grass towards the sheep who pop their heads out of the bracken, two feet in, in front of you, invisible until they decide to show themselves. A city with a magical space like this so that everyone might experience the wonder that nature brings us. Should I turn this next corner? I can only hope to find a long cobbled street, a wide grey stone street with more than enough space to set up a marketplace where street vendors can cry their wares as commuters weave and dodge in between them. Busy, bustling, a true city scene, yet not one of them too busy to stop and admire the artwork of colours, patterns, prospects in front of them. The old man selling the young man fruits and pearls of wisdom, the young lady serving the two old ladies with a small smile of hope that she may get to this venerable age and be just as kind as the couple in front of her. Different generations, characters, races, religions, people, all together in the street without cars, this street filled with commuters who don't give the impression of panic rushing. Possibly this street holds the answer, potentially the next, perhaps the one after. How many corners do I have to turn to get only a glimpse of the city of dreams? Maybe it's just an illusion. I hope not. Lovely. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, I'm sitting, listening to you reading it, um, and one of the things I really loved about the, the piece, um, the sheer kind of relentless pace of it and you've you've read it at a at a real clip as well um possibly you're slightly nervous that's that's fine but it really conveyed there's a there's a real sense of urgency to the piece that i really loved thank you really really good let me now uh hand over to jack to announce uh the winner in this category jack. Uh, thanks dave um before i uh, introduce charlotte and the city square can i just concur with uh, uh, your comments about two 18 year olds showing such incredible yeah. maturity. Like you, I, I just wouldn't believe 18 year olds could write like that. So yeah. very well done. Well done to Michelle, uh, 18. Uh, you've clearly got a great future as an aspiring author and TV writer. I loved Atlantis, this story uh, beneath the waves as a swimmer runs out of air ending with a great image, the choir would sing for my soul. I love that. And well done, Shannon, also 18. Like me, loves reading and writing. But I enjoyed running, opening with the reality of uh, modern buildings and the sameness of it all. And the fact she's looking for a house with a rainbow wind chime and the hope of a city of dreams somewhere out there wonderful i've really enjoyed it but the uh, winner is charlotte clipston uh, a horse rider dog walker and for whom like me stories the stories are the source of magic and charlotte's going to read her winning entry in the 14 to 19 um, section and it's the city square over to charlotte um hi <clears throat> I sit on a bench and close my eyes, remembering the sounds of people bustling past. So many people in one place, at one moment. So many memories here, in this forgotten square. A little girl skips along happily, excited to go to the shops. I open my eyes to look at what was once my favourite place in the world, the Lego store. Now a small, empty shoe shop sits in its place. A soft smile creeps across my lips as my eyes gently close once more. The child screams out with rage as her siblings run off without her, and tears fall down her face. Swings of the desolate playground creak in the wind, longing for the days when the sound of happy laughter would fill the air. The teenager nervously clutches her handbag as she meets a boy for coffee. The coffee shop is one of the few things that remains in this square, so it has long since shut. The lights have been turned off, and the closed sign has gathered layers upon layers of dust. A young woman cries for joy as a young man gets down on one knee in the same place they first met. I open my eyes to gaze wistfully at the pavement right here. I see past the grubby exterior to the shiny, freshly laid concrete that sparkle with joy. Tears from my eyes 
and I hastily closed them once more. The family of the past, the baby in the pram wailing as they make their way to the new, shiny park. How could I have allowed myself to forget this place? How could I have allowed dust to gather on my childhood without letting my own children experience the same joy? A woman walks here alone, following a funeral, sinking to her knees in despair. One accident, but so many lives lost. The entire family put to rest, leaving just me behind. An old woman returns to the place of her childhood, but hurries away as the memories flood back. I could not face it. I could not face thinking of my entire life, all that I've loved and lost. But now, a frail old lady sits on a bench, savouring the memories of her lifetime. She faced many struggles, but she lived through such happiness. She lived right here. Just one person, but so many memories. One square in one city, but a whole lifetime. This is where my dreams came true, and this is where I lay them to rest. Well done, Charlotte. Thank you. Before I pass back to Dave for the adult fiction section, can I just say that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I really enjoyed the city square, sitting on a bench, staring at the Lego store, wonderful images of life in the square. And there's a line there that I wish I could have written, Charlotte. The line is, how could I have allowed dust to gather on my childhood? Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your piece of writing. So back to Dave, and I'm looking forward to this section. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I, I love Charlotte's piece as well. I've so much condensed into 500 words. I'm, I'm a short story writer, but I'm not a flash fiction writer. And, and anybody that can convey so much in such a short piece of writing has my complete admiration. Fantastic stuff. Okay, uh, let me introduce the first of the readers in our adult fiction section. Uh, this is a story called The Crack of Spring, uh, which was written by Janet Lovell. Uh, and tonight is going to be read by her friend Maureen O'Brien. Uh, Maureen, please, uh, the microphone is all yours, as it were. Thank you. They were told how he entered and how he left. They knew he'd stood at the end of their bed, smiling as if offering gifts. They didn't scream or reach for the cordless phone next to the large print book, 30 Ways with Cupcakes. They stayed side by side, slit-eyed, heads motionless on triangular pillows, faded sheets to chins. If he was a thief, there was nothing much to steal. A black marble cat from Egypt a long service watch, coral beads and freshwater pearls looped on a mirror trinket box. The intruder opened a wardrobe and put on a tweed jacket, leather patched elbows, a flop of orange from a breast pocket. He shivered ever so slightly and cracked his fingers one at a time. They linked thumbs closed eyelids and crawled in deeper. The jacket smelt of yesterday's walk through Linford Wood, pine trees and bluebells, heady in early spring. He tiptoed to the side of their bed, took the cover from the water jug, a macrame circled edge with tiny shells, a souvenir from Rhodes. They heard him pop paracetamol from a foil and swallowed from the water jug, quietly as if not wanting to wake them. The room lightened. A milk van pulled up and drove away. Dogs barked in the backyard. The hibernating bee shifted the net curtain slightly. The intruder cracked his fingers again and left their bedroom. They heard him lift the toilet lid, his urine flow hitting China. He turned a tap and slid soap 
from the oyster dish. He opened every room off the landing. Doors handles squeaked, needing oil again. He went downstairs on tiptoe and into the kitchen. They heard him open the pink smeg, place a plate on the work surface, slide a meat cleaver from the knife block. They could smell salt roast bacon last night left over. And then he left. They waited in the warm bed before dialing emergency. The intruder was picked up soon enough. Their description essential. The policewoman said he was hunched, skinny, the look of Jarvis Cocker about him, the jacket, she supposed. Security came to their house, fitted window locks and a CCTV over the porch. They will give emergency, they were given emergency alarms on blue cords and reassured it won't happen again. They didn't tell anyone the intruder hadn't left. He was by the bed, fingering the Mikami circle and urinating in the toilet bowl. His fingers were inside the pink smeg, circling a meat dish, one hand on the meat block on the knife block. He made salt bacon taste germy. His cracking fingers were in shoe heels on oak floors, hammering down on skylights when it rained and rice grains poured into saucepans. When they walked through Linford Wood, they hurried away from a boxy kennel thing made of sticks. Crack, crack, crack. They imagined their intruders crouched inside the kennel, waiting like a starved dog, knowing they were too old to run. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. For, you've read that beautifully, Maureen. Uh, such a, a beautifully atmospheric piece. There's a real build-up of, of tiny details in, in that. A marvellous piece of writing. And... I can visualise the whole thing as I read it. I'm I'm in that room. Uh, really wonderful, Jack. Your your comments. Uh, only to say, uh, like you, I really enjoyed it. Well read, Maureen, and congratulations to uh, uh, Jana. I found it a very evocative piece of writing with a wonderful use of language and terrific images. Yeah. And my favourites were the smell of the jacket, and I saw Dave nod when Maureen read so beautifully this image, the hibernating bee shifted the neck curtain slightly. Yeah. It's wonderful, isn't it? Tiny, tiny details, beautiful. Oh, what a category this is. <laughs> I wish we could hear all 40. <laughs> These are brilliant, aren't they? Anyway, um, back to you for uh, Kirsty's coming up, I think. Okay. Uh, our next piece this evening is Kirsty Newman uh, with her story, uh, City of Dreams. Let me... <clears throat> Kirsty is 26, uh, she's from Milton Keynes and has lived here for almost 25 of them. Uh, she's currently working in advertising but has always had a passion for writing. Uh, your passion is paying off, Kirsty. Please, please take your, your place at the microphone. Okay. It's going to hurt for a while but I'm here to take as much of that pain away as I can, she said as she held me tightly. I was sobbing, that whole body shaking, trying to catch your breath type of sobbing. Rosie was my best friend. I didn't have a best friend growing up. I'd kept myself to myself. But Rosie and I met when we worked in a call center at 22. It was the year I moved out of my parents' place and I wanted this city to be the city where all my dreams came true. And it was. By 26, I had a best friend. I was engaged to the most wonderful man, Adam, and I had a great job working as part of the marketing team for the shopping center. That's the problem with dreams though. Eventually you wake up and it'll all be gone. It'll all be in your head. Every perfect moment, the dancing on the clouds moment, singing out loud, all the magic that dreams can create, all gone in the blink of an eye. It was a Tuesday. Mum had been taken to hospital after a fall. I rushed home to grab a few things before heading over. I was so blinded by the worry that I missed the candles burning in the living room and the two glasses of half-drunk wine on the kitchen counter. I even missed the red heels at the bottom of the stairs. 
I could hear the shower running, but I just needed to grab my toiletries and let him know I'd be away for a few days. I was not prepared to see another woman in that bathroom. Naively, I shouted for Adam. It was only when he came running across the landing, displaying a face I can only describe as a deer in headlights, that I realised. And it hurt. But I was needed elsewhere. My family needed me, and I had to go. That Tuesday was three months ago. Mum was fine, but needed looking after for a few weeks. I was let go from my job, and I didn't talk to Adam. I blocked his number. I didn't even want an explanation. But I moved in with Rosie, and last week I did my dream job. Things are feeling good again, and I'm ready for the city to give me a new dream. This morning I was singing along to the radio whilst I was washing up and caught Rosie in the doorway smiling. I added bubbles to my chin, grabbed the spoon I was clear cleaning and put on a performance. After the song finished, Rosie whispered, I've missed this. You don't sing when you're sad and the world has been really quiet without you recently. And just like that, with a single sentence, I learned what it meant to be truly loved. Not in the shout it from the rooftops type of way, but silently mm -hmm. and without even knowing it. Okay. Dave, do you want to respond to that? Because that really came from the heart. It did, and it, and it came with, with Gusto and Bravura too. That was wonderfully delivered, Gusto. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay then, um, Kirsty. Can I just say that um, the way you recounted the problems with dreams and you encapsulated a perceptive insight into true love it was full of powerful images, and I particularly like the dancing on clouds moment. I'm still trying to recover from it because I was so emotionally involved in that. <laughs> I read it so well, heck. Um, but guess what's coming? I've been looking forward to this. This is a guy uh, full of imagination. He's the winner in this category. I'm talking about Phil Sky. Um, Phil is already a published author of science fiction, he's into the dystopian genre uh, and um, his debut novel is um, called uh, A Girl Called Ari and it's on Amazon. Uh, his piece is called Strawberry Ice Dream. Don't miss the last line of this because it is brilliant. So over to you Phil and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Strawberry Ice Dream. It had been a while since I'd invested in any new dreams, and there's only so many times I could ride a white furry dragon across a magical land. The store was a new one, Strawberry Ice Dream, for a better sleep, stop counting sheep. Squeezed into Milton Hall, its pink and white storefront sat between bespoke nose and Pete's traditional old-fashioned hoverboards. Can I help you, sir? The girl looked up from her tablet and smiled. I've always been bad at shopping, but without an updated brain scan, it's hard to order dreams online. The code behind one person's perfect Martian hike might be experienced by another as having the bottom half of your leg chewed off by a triceratops. At college, I'd learned this the hard way, and I still, can't see, um, I still can't see a portrait of Henry VIII without shuddering. Well, I said, I keep having the same recurring dream. The girl nodded. Have you considered something involving riding a white furry dragon across a magical land? Perhaps she recognised my pained expression. Hmm, she said. A red furry dragon? I shook my head. You know, she said. If you're looking for something different, research has shown that if we dream of our collective past, we actually become more mindful of the present. She tapped her fingers and turned her tablet towards me. It showed a busy painting, yet somehow I found it, found it soothed me. Fiona Boyd, the girl was saying, fiction, non-fiction and reference. Three dreamlike figures, a girl and two boys, their eyes averted, basked in spring fresh sunlight appearing both part of and separate from the world around them. When was this painted? I asked. Long ago, she said, before the pandemic or the dome. This was how they dreamed of our city, by painting it because they didn't have dream organs. The painting exuded a sunny pioneer's optimism of a world born fresh and new, where reflective windows merged with freshly levelled roads, clouds like cotton wool and water like glass. Did people really swim in the lake, I asked. The girl shrugged. 
Who knows what they really did? I mean, not to put you off, but people used to sell clothing in these shops. People would come in, try stuff on, in little cubicles next to each other. I shuddered. But it wasn't all bad, she said, and a lot of our customers love this dream. Out of interest, I asked. What else do you have in this genre? The girl chewed at her bottom lip. Well, there's one about concrete cows, but that's really for a much more specific customer. I mean, if, if you think... Oh no, I said quickly, shaking my head. I, I think I'd rather stick with the void. The girl smiled. Of course. Um, for 50 credits extra, we could add some blue fairy dragons. No, no, I said. I'm, I'm done with dragons. Of course, we have to ask. The girl slid her fingers across uh, slid her fingers across the screen. And how would you like to pay today? Barcode or implant? That's it. That's the line. <laughs> Phil, brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Um, strawberry ice dream. Amazing imagination. Uh, here we have dreams for sale in a future world with my favourite final line. How would you like to pay today? Barcode or implant. Many congratulations on, on winning this. Um, Thank you. Well, well deserves. And lovely, uh, you know, I've been sitting here this afternoon reading these, but they've, been, they've brought, you know, you bring them to life and it, it's been wonderful. Dave, I've got a few final comments, but do you want to come in and, uh, or do you want to leave it with me for a few minutes? I, I, I just wanted to, to offer Phil a couple of comments on that piece, which I, I absolutely loved. And well, I, I thought was was really clever was the way that you worked in the the Boyd and Evans painting. If, if any of the people here don't know, uh, that's a real painting and it hangs in Milton Keynes Library and it's it's from the very early days of the city when there was a painting as that kind of ref reflected or summed up the dream of what Milton Keynes could be and projecting that however many years or decades into the future as some unfathomable relic I just thought was not only clever but wonderfully witty too. A fabulous piece Phil, thank you. Yeah, Jack. yeah I'd like to just uh, finish off with a couple of things, a little bit about poetry and <laughs> then uh, because I get lots and lots of emails about uh, can you give me some advice, just one or two thoughts on that uh, to close. Um, my favourite poet for what it's worth is T.S. Eliot and I love his Little Giddings uh, for quartets but I was brought up a long time ago I'm probably the oldest person I would think looking around at all these images mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, I was brought up on the uh, the beat poets of America Allen Ginsberg, um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti <coughs> excuse me and the uh, Mersey sound of the Liverpool poets, Roger McGough. But when I worked at um, uh, York St. John University, I had the opportunity to meet some of the recent poet laureates. So uh, during my work there, and so I met Andrew Motion and I had uh, a lovely chat with Carol and Duffy. Now I've not met the incumbent uh, uh, poet laureate, Simon Armitage, but can I just recommend a brilliant poem that is written called Lockdown. We're all living in lockdown. Uh, he's teamed up with an actress, Florence Pugh, and it's become a short film. It's well worth watching and listening. So look out for that. Simon Armitage, uh, Lockdown. Great poem. Um, also, I get lots of mail. I try and reply to everybody. Who say, usually people are saying, I've enjoyed your book. When's the next one? But some people, like we've had tonight, uh, budding authors. So like you, Dave, I, I just deal in short stories that I put together and put into a novel format. But um, I often recommend the Writers and Artists Yearbook, quite a thick paperback. But it's got a list of literary agents, and that clearly helped me, having, having an agent. There's poetry competitions, there's tips for authors, there's a list of publishers and for those um i think it was uh, was it who was it was into um aspiring i think it was michelle uh, an aspiring author and tv writer that we heard from earlier there's yes. 
um, tips for writing for uh, television and uh, radio. And I finished by saying, <coughs> excuse me, I always carry a notebook. I listen to conversations. Um, and uh, I, I, I spend quite a lot of time on dialogue. Conflict, yes, but dialogue. Spend a long time because dialogue drives the plot forward. And I would say to everybody out there, please don't stop writing. Don't be disheartened by rejection because that happens uh, to us all. I've really enjoyed tonight and I'm thrilled that uh, I was part of it. I'm glad I've got this. Uh, if you haven't got it, make sure you get it because there's some terrific work in here. And of course, we've not heard from some of the people inside uh, the City of Dreams. And to those people who feel, oh, well, what, why wasn't I involved? I would simply say that I mentioned at the outset that I'd written this novel. Well, I entered a competition before this novel was published. And uh, it was, uh, they asked for the first three pages of a novel. And I sent it in and I came third. And a few weeks later, this went on sale and sold 100,000. So if you're not involved uh, in tonight's readings, don't despair, keep writing, enjoy it, particularly during these difficult times of lockdown. Thank you to Dave for holding this uh, all together and best wishes to everybody out there. And I'll close now. Thank you, thank you, Jack. Yeah, and I echo all of that. Uh, there were two things I was thinking while, while Jack was speaking to you all just now. Uh, one is, as Jack said, don't give up. You are all very good writers. Uh, the example I always think of as a, an Irish writer called Amy McBride, uh, who wrote a wonderful book called A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. That was rejected by, I think, 55 publishers. <laughs> And she literally put it in a drawer and forgot about it for about five years and then went, I'll have one last try and sent it to a really small indie publisher who went, that's brilliant, we're publishing that. And it's been a huge success. So never give up, keep submitting, keep writing. Uh, a wonderful resource I was going to point you to. Uh, if you uh, have been a, a Lit Fest regular, you may have encountered uh, one of our previous performers, uh, another Irish writer, a gentleman called Paul McVeigh. Uh, as well as being a great writer and uh, a wonderful workshop leader, mm. Paul hosts a blog where he compiles all of the current writing competitions and submission windows for, for journals and, and literary magazines. It's all free. He does it out of the goodness of his heart because he's that kind of man. And it's, it's always up to date. If you are sitting there working on a poem or a short story or a longer piece of writing thinking i'm going to take the risk and i'm going to submit this somewhere have a look at paul's blog and find opportunities to send it off and and keep doing it uh, as as jack said if you're going to be a writer you're going to have to get used to rejection because boy is there going to be a lot of it along the way but the the one guaranteed way of, of never seeing your work in print is to never submit it anywhere if you want to not be published, that's it. If you want to be published, it's an uphill walk, but the summit's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to thank you all for reading. I think we should unmute everybody if Guy is there to do that. And I think we should all give each other a nice big round of applause. Let me see if I can. Okay, we're all unmuted. Okay. <laughs>